This video is a continuation of another video we had done previously in this lecture series. And in the previous video, what we wanted to do is we wanted to first of all determine the domain of the function and then also look for the x-intercepts of the function. And the idea was towards trying to solve equations because if we can solve the equation f of x equals zero, then we can solve any equation assuming f is allowed to take on any function whatsoever. And, but solving the equation f of x equals zero is equivalent to just finding the x-intercepts of the graph. Now, in these examples right here, I want to introduce a technique that's extremely useful. And this is the technique that I'll call a u-substitution. That is, we're going to substitute out we're going to substitute out an expression for the new variable u. And we usually use the number, the variable u here for, well, for two reasons. One, u isn't a super common variable that we use in these algebra classes. You know, our go-to variables are usually x, y, and z. So u is often available for us to substitute out. So, so, that, that, so that's sort of the truth. And then also, it leads to some awkward grammatical statements when I say things like u is. Um, you know, it, it's going to be fun. It'll be fun for the closed captioning auto-generated thing. U is. Anyways, so how, what, do, what does U substitution mean? So U substitution, we're going to do is we're going to take some function. Uh, you know, it's going to be some function like f of x is some expression of f of x right here. And we're just going to replace a complicated form with a U. Basically, we're, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be recognizing there's two functions in play here. So we're going to have like h of x is equal to some type of composition of functions. So like h, let's just say it this way, h is equal to some function like, say, uh, g composed with f, right? And so we're just going to be like, oh, let's just recognize we have this inner function u, like here, and use that to help us out here. Why could that be useful? Well, let's look at this situation right here. So you have f of x is equal to x to the 2 thirds minus 3 times x to the 1 third minus 10. If this was an equation, and this, if this is a function, we want to find its x-intercepts, we set this expression equal to 0. How would we go about solving this? Well, if you make the following observation, life becomes a whole lot easier for you. It's like, I, I see like x to like one third powers, right? Um, you have like this x to the one third. If I try this idea of u substitution, I could actually replace that with a u. But what about x to the, what about x to the two thirds? Well, x to the two thirds is the same thing as x to the one third squared right here, right? But x to the one third is equal to u. So this thing is the same thing as u squared. And so if you make this u substitution, our function f, what we're saying here is f is equal to, well, let, let me say it this way. Let's take our equation. We're going to replace the x to the 2 thirds. It becomes a u squared. Then the x to the 1 third becomes a u, and you get negative 10 still equal to 0. So what this then became is a quadratic equation. So with the u substitution, we now have a quadratic equation which we can try to solve. I often refer to this as a quadratic-like equation. It's, it's like a quadratic equation if we do the appropriate u substitution. And so basically what we're saying is the following. We've made the following recognition. If I take the function g of g of u to equal u squared minus 3u minus 10, right? And I take the function h of x to equal x to the one third. What we've now recognized is that f of x is equal to g of h of x. That's what we've now recognized in this situation. Now, you put the function x to the one-third inside of a quadratic function. And so in order to solve for these x-intercepts, I'm going to first solve the outer function, g of x, which is this quadratic function. And I can do that by factoring. Factoring we've done in previous settings. Or you could use the quadratic formula as well. Um, and so we have to factor. Let's see, factors of negative 10 that add up to be negative 3. We could take negative 5 and positive 2. Right, negative 5 times 2 is negative 10, and negative 5 plus 2 is negative 3. So that then gives us uh, this one, u minus 5 times u plus 2 is equal to 0. By the zero product property, we get that u minus 5 equals 0, or u plus 2 equals 0. For which then we can solve for u, we get u equals 5, and we get u equals negative 2. But what is u? u is See how that happened there? U is x to the one third. So substituting back in the x, we get x to the one third equals five or negative two, like so. So how do we get rid of the one third power? We're gonna cube, right? So we cube both sides. In which case, then we get our solutions. X equals five cubed, which is 125, or x equals negative two cubed, which would equal negative eight, which then gives us the two solutions to this quadratic-like equation. So if we can recognize 
and we can recognize some type of u substitution, we can then solve many quadratic-like equations. Let's look at another example here. Let's take g of x this time to equal 4x to the fourth plus 7x squared minus 2. So I want us to recognize this has a quadratic-like structure, right? Because you have this x squared right here. You also have this x to the fourth. I could treat this like a polynomial of degree 4, and I could try to look for solutions and factoring like we did previously in this lecture series. But the u substitution turns out really nice here. If you take u to be x squared, then that means u squared will equal x to the squared squared. That is, it's x to the fourth. And so then our function here will look like g of u is equal to 4u squared plus 7u minus 2. We set this equal to 0 because, after all, we're looking for the x-intercepts here. When does this thing equal 0? We then can proceed to factor this thing. We need to find factors of 4 and negative 2. So 4 times negative 2, uh, negative 2 is equal to negative 8. Um, can we find factors of negative 8 that add up to be 7? Well, we could take 8 times negative 1. That'll do it. And so then we're going to proceed to factor this thing by groups. So we get 4u squared plus 8u minus u minus 2 equals 0. We're going to take the first group and the second group. The first group can offer up a 4u, leaving behind u plus 2. The second group can offer up a negative 1. So you get negative 1 leaving behind u plus 2 equals 0, which is good because now we see that u plus 2, u plus 2 is common to both. We factor out that common divisor of u plus 2. You're going to end up with 4u four, four minus 1 times u plus 2. So once you factor this thing, you can substitute back in u at any moment. You could solve for u and go from there, or you could just plug in, you could plug in what u as x in right now if you prefer. It doesn't really matter when you do it. After, after we recognize the quadratic form, we can then switch stuff, stick back in the x squared. So that's going to give us 4x squared minus 1 times x squared plus 2. This equals 0, in which case then we can set each of these factors equal to 0 and solve. So we get 4x squared minus 1 equals 0, or we have x squared plus 2 equals 0. In which case, when you solve the first one, add 1 to both sides, you get 4x squared equals 1. Uh, divide both sides by 4, we get x squared equals 1 fourth. And then divide both sides by 2, we're going to end up with x equals plus or minus the square root of 1 fourth which is plus or minus one half, all right? So you get those values right there. With the other one, when you try to solve for that one, uh, you're gonna subtract two from both sides, you get x squared equals negative two. If you take the square root of both sides, you'll get x equals plus or minus the square root of negative two, which is plus or minus i times the square root of two. So then you have to make a decision. Um, do I allow for non-real solutions or not? Remember, our goal here is to find x-intercepts of a function for which an x-intercept must be a real number. So these imaginary numbers would be discarded, in which case then the only x-intercepts would turn out to be uh, plus or minus one-half. So there's the two solutions, x equals one-half and negative one-half, like so. So this one, this one right here, when you look at it, it's like h of x equals x squared minus one quantity squared plus x squared minus one minus 12. In this situation, many of you might be tempted to, I'm just going to foil this thing out and combine like terms. I get a quadratic, uh, then I can solve that quadratic. It's like, but it wouldn't be actually a quadratic. You're going to get x squared times an x squared. Well, it's a degree 4 polynomial. I could try to do that. You could do that, but that'd be like taking the Mona Lisa, throwing it in a shredder and be like, we don't need this. We don't need this. I could probably draw a picture. You know, let's not destroy the beautiful architecture that's already there. Because notice here, you have an x squared minus 1. Let's call that u. Then you have an x squared minus 1 squared. Let's call that u. And so it's actually it would become a u squared. And so using the substitution, h of u would look like you're going to get u squared plus u minus 12. This is a quadratic that's much easier to factor, right? Oh, factors of negative 12 that have to be 1. I could take u plus 4 and u minus 3. Set this equal to 0. This would tell me that u equals negative 4 or positive 3. Then we're going to remove the substitution and go back to x because u was equal to x squared minus 1. We get x squared minus 1 equals negative 4, and we get x squared minus 1 equals 3. Add 1 to both sides. On the first one, we'll get x squared is equal to negative 3. On the second one, when we add 1, we're going to get x squared equals 4. Now again, so then we're going to take the square root of both sides. We're going to get x equals plus or minus i times the square root of 3 here, and then we're going to get x equals 
plus or minus the square root of four, that is plus or minus two. We then have to make a decision again, do we allow for non-real solutions? Again, as our original goal was to find x-intercepts, we have to discard anything that's not real, and therefore our x-intercepts would be positive two and negative two. So this recon recognition of a a recognition of a u substitution can be very helpful, not just for doing these quadratic like equations, but for functions in general. But this video focuses on quadratic like equations. So this example here, capital F of X equals six times X to the two fifths plus 11 times X to the one fifth minus 10. Maybe you're starting to see the pattern here. Whenever you have something like X to the two over whatever P, you know, this is just going to be x to the 1 over p squared. So we see that we have 2 fifths versus 1 fifth power. So we're going to set u equal to be x to the 1 fifth. And therefore, u squared is the same thing as x to the 2 fifths right there. So then our quadratic equation has the form 6 times u squared plus 11u minus 10. This is equal to 0. We could factor this, right? Um, we could also use the quadratic formula, whichever we prefer. Uh, this one does actually factor, right? So taking your coefficients together, 6 times negative 10, that's going to give you negative 60. Can I find factors of negative 60 that add up to be uh, 11? And that's going to be 15 times negative 4. And there's a little bit of guesswork that happens there. Absolutely. But the quadratic formula can be used if you don't feel comfortable with this guesswork that happens. So you're going to get 6u squared plus 15u. That's going to be our first group. Then the second group will consist of, let's see, negative 4u minus 10. This is still equal to 0. The first group can offer up a 3u, leaving behind 2u plus 5. The second group can offer up a negative 2. We're just factoring out the GCD there. And that gives us a 2u plus 5 again. You'll notice, of course, that the 2u plus 5 is the same. So we can factor it out. That then gives us the factorization of 3u minus 2 times 2u plus 5 equals 0. At this moment, I usually like to substitute back in my value. u equals uh, x to the 1 fifth. So we get 3x to the 1 fifth minus 2. And then we're going to get 2x to the 1 fifth plus 5 is equal to 0. The zero product property gives us two equations. So we have 3x to the 1 fifth minus 2 equals 0. And we have 2x to the 1 fifth plus 5 equals 0. Be very cautious on what operations you're doing here. On the first one, we're going to add 2 to both sides. This gives us 3x to the 1 fifth uh, is equal to 2. Uh, divide both sides by 3. So we end up with x to the 1 third is equal to 2 fifths, or 2 thirds, excuse me. And then we have to take the fifth power of both sides. And so we end up with, as our value there, x is equal to 2 to the 5th over 3 to the 5th. Let me scooch it up just a little bit more. For which 2 to the 5th is 32, and 3 to the 5th is going to be 243. So that's one solution. Uh, the other one, uh, if we go solving for that one, we're going to subtract 5 from both sides. This gives us 2x to the 1 5th is equal to negative 5. Divide both sides by 2. Whoops, divide by two. This is gonna give us x to the one fifth is equal to negative five halves. Then the next step is we're gonna take the fifth power, right? For which, since the since we are taking the fifth, we have x to the, uh, the fifth root of x, excuse me, on the left-hand side, there's no reason why that can't be negative, so we don't have a domain problem here because the right-hand side is negative. Um, we end up then with x is equal to negative five to the fifth over two to the fifth, and that should equal negative 3,125 over 32 again. And so these will be our two solutions to this quadratic-like equation. So we get one over here, and then we get one over here. All right, I want to do one more example in this video. This time, let's do one involving logarithms, but you can perhaps see what it is by now. What's the u substitution? We have the natural log of x quantity squared minus the natural log of x minus 6. So we're going to set u equal to the natural log of x right here. And so then our function g of u becomes u squared minus u minus 6, which that's a nice one to factor there. You can factor that thing as u minus 3 times u plus 2. So notice we took factors of negative 6, negative 3 times 2, that add up to be negative 1, negative 3 plus 2. 
And so then getting rid of the u, we go back to the natural log. We're gonna have the natural log of x minus three times the natural log of x plus two. These things equal zero. We're looking for the x-intercepts here. Setting both factors equal to zero, you get the natural log of x minus three is equal to zero. And we get the natural log of x plus two equals zero. Pay attention to problems with domain and range for which the, the natural log potentially could have, right? Um, if you add three on the on the first one, both to both sides, you get the natural log of three, natural log of x equals three, excuse me. Then you exponentiate, you're gonna get x is equal to e cubed, right? Um, the natural log doesn't have any problems with the range. It's the domain that's an issue, which we're okay here. And then if you subtract two from both sides on the second one, you'll get the natural log of x equals negative two. Now this is what I'm saying here. You can actually exponentiate both sides even if the right-hand side's a negative, you're gonna get x equals e to the negative two, or if you prefer one over e squared. What it, it doesn't really matter too much here. So you're gonna get these two x-intercepts. You're gonna get e, e cubed, and then one over e to the square, right? So now, unlike all the other examples here, um, we were looking for, so remember, our original goal is to find x-intercepts, but also to find discontinuities. Where are locations where the function could potentially be undefined. Well, so the, the domain of the function is of concern to us here, right? Uh, notice that because of our u right here, this is the natural log. Uh, the quadratic doesn't have any problem with domains, but the natural log does. So the domain here of g is going to be zero to infinity, which none of our x-intercepts fell into that range, so we didn't have to discard them, but we do wanna pay attention to uh, where is this function undefined. In particular, this function will have a vertical asymptote there'll be a vertical asymptote at x equals zero because the natural log has that vertical asymptote at x equals zero.